in my previous um, um, theology uh, video, I talked about why I believe in God. Um, I think there's a lot of good reasons to believe in God, and I, I think that ultimately the idea in a, in a self-producing universe is just so entirely absurd. I mean, we don't have any scientific examples of things creating themselves, and neither do we have any scientific examples of things existing in this physical spectrum, dimension, however you want to say it, of things d existing in this physical universe that don't have age. Everything we find has age. Everything in our universe is governed by time. That stands to reason that there's something outside of this physical realm, prison, that is beyond that. That just, it just seems to make sense. I mean, it's like standing in a room and saying there's no outside because the curtains are closed. That, that doesn't mean that there's no outside, that just means you've never seen the outside. Now you can test everything in the room as much scientifically as you want. That doesn't necessitate that there's nothing outside of the room. That doesn't make that conclusion. If you assume that conclusion, that's fine. But it's not something that your research has shown. And that's something that's very important because I believe in science. I'm a person of science. But I don't believe that science can give us all the answers. I believe that there are things that are are obvious blinds, blind spots of, of science. For instance, science can only test what is observable and repeatable. So that already is limited. Furthermore, science can't test things that are abstract, only concrete. Science can't test the existence of truth or equations. I mean, it, it can't it can't test those kinds of those kinds of things. Um, so then that takes us to okay, maybe maybe you think that there's a good a reason to believe in God. I don't, but maybe you do. Whatever, that that's fine. But who's to say that you've got the right answer? Well, okay, so let's look at that. Why I think Christianity is the one true religion. Why I think that it's the only one that ha really has the right answer. Um, a little bit of a brief history lesson. Okay, Judaism developed um, by they claim in the 1400s. Um, some other people claim that it didn't develop until the 600s, but that raises some serious questions that have never been answered satisfactorily. Satisfactory. Therefore, I kind of stick to the 1400 um, origin because it's the only one that has any proof to support it. Um, if you'd like any more on that, you can read uh, John Oswald. Is a you know, let's just start there. Just read John Oswald. Um, his book is uh, The Bible Among Myths, and then you might say, well, okay, but how do you even know that the Old Testament was written that, or the books of the law were written that long ago? Well, thanks to surprisingly fantastic research by a few individuals, um, we can date it. First off, uh, the tabernacle was built at a time when there were other tabernacles like that, around the 1400s to 1200s. If you go much later after that, they didn't look like that, and so Israel would have been building a tabernacle off something that no longer existed. So there's that. Um, the law was written in a format that was popular after 1400 and before 1200. So they really wouldn't have had access to the kind of things to have written it afterwards. It's just there, There's a lot of other things that I could say, but I'm kind of getting a little bit off track, I feel. So let's just kind of keep things... Um, on track here. Before I even get going, there's going to be people who raise this rebuttal of bigotry and that kind of stuff. So let's just kind of clarify a few things. It's not hateful. Someone has to be right and someone else has to be wrong. Okay. For instance, there's a speed limit. Let's say the speed limit says 35. And I say, no, I think that the speed limit is 75. Then a cop's going to pull me over and he's going to say, well, the speed limit is 35. And I'm going to say, well, I think the speed limit is 35 or 75. And then he's going to say, well, I think that the speed limit is 35 because it's posted 35 and you were not going 35. You see what I mean? One of us has to be wrong and one of us has to be right. Um, either there is a God or there is not a God. Either truth matters or truth does not matter. Either there is morality and therefore God 
or there is no such thing as morality and everything is subjective and there is no real idea of truth there either. We are simply evolved beings that have no purpose and no right or wrong, so you can ultimately do whatever you want. The idea is that you don't get caught. Or there is a right or wrong, and therefore there is a God. So there's really – you have these two extremes here. If there is no truth, then nothing really matters at all, and this whole conversation is completely void. Like, it just doesn't matter. Either there is truth or there is not truth. So a bigot is someone who is intolerant of people with other beliefs. I completely intolerant with other people of other beliefs. Just because I think that you're wrong doesn't mean that I think that – just doesn't mean that I hate you. It's okay to disagree with someone and not hate them. That That is a possibility. Um, for instance, I don't think that pedophilia is right. The reason why I don't think that it's right is not because it grosses me out or, or because um, science shows us that the person's undeveloped. That That's not why. Why I think that it's not right is because of what the Bible says. Well, you might say, well, the Bible never says pedophilia isn't wrong. No, it never says those words, pedophilia is not wrong. However, it teaches things that teach me that pedophilia is wrong. So I believe that pedophilia is wrong because I believe that there's a standard beyond my own reasoning. I believe that homosexuality is wrong because I believe that there's a standard beyond my own. See, God created us as beings who were meant to be uh, a man and a woman, and I, and I feel like anything that is not um, in agreement with that is wrong. I don't believe I believe that sex with animals is wrong because it's not a man with a woman. I believe pedophilia is wrong because it's not a man with a woman. I believe that having multiple wives is wrong because it's not one man and one woman. I believe that homosexuality is wrong because it's not a man and a woman. That's not bigotry. That's expressing my own beliefs. Now, I'm a bigot if I don't if I am not tolerant of people who disagree with me. For instance, Let's say there's a homosexual, and I say, you know what? We just need to kill you off. Well, that would be bigotry and also a lot of other things, but you get what I'm saying. Everyone can have a, an opinion, but that doesn't mean that every opinion is right. Okay, there's, there's a big difference there. Everybody wants to be heard. Everybody wants their opinion to be right. That's fine. But at the end of the day, one of our opinions is going to be wrong. Either I'm wrong or you're wrong. And remember, if nobody's wrong, then that means that the irritation that you feel when something political is said ultimately doesn't really matter at all. So then that takes us to a follow-up question that is absolutely essential for the idea of which God is right. We then have to ask the question, well, what is a God? First off, these are things that I believe based off of what makes logical sense. God, by definition, has to be something that, in my opinion, has to conform to all these things. First off, he has to be all-powerful. If he's not all-powerful, then he really isn't a god. He's just a powerful being. Um, he has to be all-knowing. If he can be fooled or, or lied to or whatever, then he really is kind of held to the, held to the standards of, of this physical existence, and he really isn't that godlike. Um, he can't be – he has to be good. He can't be an immoral being because morality, by definition, has to be a created or an errant or something standard. Well, if it's something that evolved, then it's really not a standard. It's flexible. If it's something that was just put into creation, then we know, okay, that there is a standard out there. So then if it was put into creation, that would stand to reason that the, per that the person who did the creating – would conform to the standard because he created the standard. In other words, he is the standard. Okay, all right, now this 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 is starting to fit. Um, he can't be a super, superhuman. He can't be like a person, acting like a person, looking like a person, just with more powers than a person. Obviously, that goes hand in hand with this one. He can't be destroyed. It can't be something that you can just overpower him with enough firepower or somehow ascend to his state and overthrow him. He has to be something that is that is beyond that. He has to be uncreated and he has to be eternal. Okay, these are kind of hand in hand. I put them together just to make sure that um, they, you know, my definition is absolutely clear. Uncreated means that there is no point when something else brought him into existence. Eternal means that he has always and will always exist. Okay, so obviously it sh well at least it should be obvious that there's only one God that really conforms to my list of standards as is. All the other gods I feel like are weak. They don't have that standard. 
um, and therefore not really worthy of being praised just by standard. Um, also, uh, let me just bring up real briefly the Bible. M most revelation that people encounter has to do with human origins, you know, like the power of self. Um, salvation is, is always brought on by works. Yet with God, we see something else. We see something that, no, you're not able to earn your own salvation. I'm only if you trust in me. That is the only God in existence in the knowable world that conforms to that standard. And the re revelation is something that goes beyond what every other religion revealed. Even look at – so I, I started saying this, and I got a little bit sidetracked. The idea of th this history lesson, okay? So Judaism got got going, let's say 14 – you know what? Let's say it got going in the 600s. Let's go ahead and say – no, there's no basis for it being coming into existence in the 1400s, even though I think that's totally wrong. But let's just assume that it came into in, in the 600s, six, or even the 500s, maybe even the 400s. Who cares? So then Christianity comes into being from that, and uh, Islam, Muslims, came, came from basically the conglomeration of Christianity and Judaism. I mean, it's more complicated than that, but let's keep things simple. Islam and the Quran called the believers of the prophet, to return to works. Judaism taught works as a result of faith. Judaism taught works that showed faith. Christianity said, we are still held to works, but as a result of what our faith has accomplished. In other words, our faith has looks back at something, Christ's death, and it says we are saved. Therefore, we do good works. It doesn't make us more saved. It's just the reaction of true faith. If you truly believe something, you will act differently. If I truly believe that there is no God, then I'm going to act differently. I'm going to live however I want, and I'm going to do things that I want to do. And I'm not going to do things that I don't want to do. But if I believe that my life is not my own, then all of a sudden, well, now I'm going to do things that I don't necessarily want to do. I don't want to always forgive people, but I forgive because God forgave me. See what I mean? There's a reason. Now, Judaism looked forward to something that was to come. The, the sacrifices, they kept offering them over and over again, believing that God was going to do something in the future. Well, God has done that in Christianity. Whereas Islam, on the other hand, says, no, we should now return to the works. Well... That doesn't really make sense. If we're still held to the works, then we really aren't saved, and our faith in the past was in vain in Judaism, and it's in vain now in Christianity. Either there is a God or there is not one. So, okay, this is this is where it's looking why I believe that there is um, that I that Christianity has the right answer. So, at the end of the day, we have two options: either there is a God or there is not a God. If there is not a God then the argument is completely void, and it doesn't matter at all. I already answered why I think that there is one um, in a previous uh, video, so there's that. That takes us to the next question. So, okay, if there is a God, then that would mean that, by definition, it can't be all the religions, because they all say that this God or gods are drastically different, ranging from slightly evil to extremely evil to entirely good to partly good. So you have this, this wide spectrum, and so... Not everyone can be right. It stands to reason that one of them is right and the other ones are wrong. So if there is a God, it is either one or many. Either there's a single God or there's multiple gods. Okay. If there is competition, that means that there are some gods who are more powerful or they can gang up on another god with the other gods. Competition of some kind, that means none of them are superior. And also that means that none of them are ultimate. They fail to be God. So you've got this one who is you know, powerful in this area and this one who is powerful in this one. And so they're in competition. Neither of them are ultimate. They're all just like brothers and sisters fighting. So we're kind of left with the problem there. If there is a God, he is either hidden or revealed. Now, if he is hidden, the whole conversation is pretty moot because we can't possibly know who he is or what he's like. 
but if he's revealed, well, okay, now we, now we can interact. Now, many people have encountered spiritual things, okay, demonic possessions, uh, dead people being raised, you know, encountering dead people in seances and that kind of stuff, um, encountering the gods of Hinduism, encountering the gods of Christ the god of Christianity, you know, all these different things. Spiritual encounters are something that people have encountered, and, 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 they, and they have been documented, uh, so it's not something you can just dismiss because you don't believe it. It's something that you have to give an answer to those things. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, for instance, uh, wrote a very extensive and well-documented um, account of his incursions into the occult, where he actually saw and encountered things, and he documented them very well. So you're going to have to give an answer to prove that there is no spiritual or other, whatever you want to call it, something else. So that right there is going to be difficult because y you can't conform it to regular science. Hence why people say that creationism is pseudoscience. But with that being said, evolution can be called pseudoscience as well because we've never, we've never seen macro evolution happen on a big scale we've never seen evolution in practice we believe it we teach it but we've never actually seen it it's one of those things where what caused the cambrian exp explosion why did the cambrian explosion happen so quickly and what caused the cambrian explosion to stop happening we don't know there's lots of theories that go around and around but ultimately we really just don't know and then even some of the things that we thought we knew, we really didn't know. Like, for instance, uh, we thought that there was no water on Earth, that the wa or very little, if any, and that all of the Earth's water sources came down through meteors. Well, according to new research, the water was here the whole time. Well, we make mistakes. <laughs> so with that being said, evolution in and of itself it doesn't match up to these standards that people are holding God to. We're in a little bit of a pickle. By the way, I'm not contradicting evolution. I believe that evolution did happen. I just don't believe it happened how they're teaching it in textbooks. I think that sometimes people are overconfident with their very limited views, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, so if God is revealed, then which one is he of the revealed gods? Either... He's, you know, the Native Americans have the concept of a, of a father god who's kind of like a kind of like a spirit. Okay, all right. Um, you know, you have the Hindus' belief that you know there's all these different gods, thousands of gods. So then you say, well, which one is it? Is is it one of the single gods or one of the many gods? I mean, which one is it? Every god in polytheistic belief patterns is limited in power or other features. Very human. Uh, has you know very, very human traits uh, is morally inconsistent can be good or bad or a mixture um, uh, and they act, ultimately they act and they think like we do that's a problem and also polytheistic polytheistic religion there's there's none of them that conform to the pattern that I mentioned about what has to qualify for God they all are less I refuse to worship something that's less I refuse to worship some, a, a being that's basically me but with a little bit of more power. I refuse to worship that. If I'm going to worship someone, it has to be something that is so far beyond my comprehension that it scares me just to think of being in the same room with that power. So if by chance I'm wrong and Hinduism is the right answer, it doesn't really matter ultimately because According to Hinduist teachings, there's the idea of karma and that kind of stuff, so I'll just be reborn later anyways. Doesn't really matter. Um, also, there's another another neat thing. The Bible and Christianity combines that the things that we do matter, do do matter in the physical world, but that the physical world isn't all there is. It combines the two. So that brings us to Yahweh, the God of the Bible who is revealed in part in the Old Testament and complete in the New, in the New Testament. So it, could this be the God that we're looking for? Now, I believe it fully conforms, he, the, the, this God fully conforms to the definition of God that I 
would have to accept in order for him to be God. Um, now, I am not including cult branch offs of Christianity. I'm not including Jehovah's Witness. I'm not including Mormonism. I'm not including any of that stuff. So Yahweh acts beyond our comprehension. That's just a fact in the world and in the Bible. We have a definite consistency there. It's something that we don't always understand why he's acting like he is. He is not held to a standard of morality, but is the standard. That, that's absolutely clear throughout Scripture. He says you have to be holy because I'm holy. Oh, well, so what is holy? Well, I just told you. It's like, oh, well, okay. Um, his word is constantly validated, even by science. I already mentioned the thing about water being on earth the whole time, just like creation said. You know, people misunderstand the Bible or they misread the Bible, and then they hold it to their mis guided beliefs about what the Bible said, but it's not really what the Bible said. So when that mis misguided belief is proven wrong, that doesn't mean the Bible is proven wrong. That means your opinion of the Bible is proven wrong. If you actually read the Bible, it has yet to be proven wrong by anything, archaeology, science, anything. So then that brings us to the problem of, well, doesn't it contradict itself? Actually, no. I, I mean, I have never found a contradiction in the Bible. I found things that appear to be a contradiction if you don't actually study the whole thing. I found that. Um, just to kind of clarify, though, the Quran doesn't necessarily have to be seen as contradicting itself. You just have to see it as a step-by-step -step process. The Quran built. So it started here and it built. The New Testament, on the other hand, doesn't contradict the Old Testament. It fulfills the Old Testament. The Quran, on the other hand, it's not that it contradicts itself. It's that it – I don't want to use the word evolved, but that's a very, very accurate term. When the prophet first started speaking, he said this, but then he kind of changed what he said to kind of fit the different circumstances. Think of it as kind of like relative. I hate to use that word, but yeah, why not? Uh, okay, uh, I have personally encountered him, and there are other people who have other as well. Now, once again, well, yeah, but other other gods or spiritual beings or whatever have been encountered. So okay, all right, that that's true. Um, he answers the why questions, which I think is something that's massively missing in most other um, religions of any kind. For instance, why is it wrong to kill? Beyond the whole, it feels wrong. Well, beyond that. That's fine, but feelings change. Our, our thoughts change. Why is it really wrong to kill? Just because I feel something? Does that mean that if I don't feel something, it's okay for me to kill, but it's not okay for you to kill if you do feel something? So there's a different standard? It doesn't make sense. He tells us it's wrong not to kill because people were created in God's image. So then that would mean that racism is wrong. Why? Because we were all created in God's image. That's it. That mean, it would mean that mentally retarded people, physically handicapped people, and fully healthy adult people equal. That gives reason. Now, to me, it doesn't make sense when people deny God but then still stand, still hold to a form of morality. Why? Why should I? Why should I be restricted by your beliefs? A couple a couple of generations ago, homosexuality was wrong, and they were not allowed to be married. And now, it is legal and accepted. So, the standard doesn't make something right or not right. So that would mean abortion could technically be wrong or right. We don't know. It's just whether it's legal or illegal. See, now we're starting to get into kind of some problems. If we have morality with not having the why of morality, we really don't have morality. We have opinions. So he answers the why questions, which to me is one of the most important things because I hate unanswered questions. I hate believing in something just because everybody tells you to believe in it. I, I, I hate that. I, I hate that. I grew up in a household that was like that religiously. You, you have to believe all this stuff, but... Why? Why do I have to believe that? He gives us purpose and gives us confidence of what he has promised. So that's kind of two-part. 
first off, he gives us purpose. Our life has, we were created for a reason. But then also he gives us confidence of what he has promised. In the Quran, you don't see, how do you know? How do you know that you're going to enter into, into paradise? And, and How do you know? Like it, it, it's, it's left unanswered. You, you have all these commands and stuff, but how do you know if you've attained it? How do you know if you, how do you know? But in Christianity, you actually get those answers, which to me is one of the most foundational elements of life. If we would just give our give ourselves time to think instead of constantly having be, having to be distracted by technology, we'd start to really start to question things, things that don't make sense. He resolved the dilemmas, purposes, and promises present in Judaism. First off, the dilemmas. There's a lot of things that happened in Judaism that didn't really make a whole lot of sense. If they're seen as separate from Christianity, for instance, the promise of someone who's going to end the end the um, in Daniel, the promise of someone who's going to end the sacrifices. Wait, what? Pause real quick. What now? <laughs> or how about um, in Jeremiah, where it talks about uh, how he's going to get how he's going to write the law on our hearts? You know, how the heck's that going to happen? What about where he talks about giving the Holy Spirit in Joel? What about where, you know, all these different things, the suffering servant, all these different things. You look throughout all of Judaism, and it's just filled with these things. And then you have, for instance, a sacrifice. Why does killing an animal mean anything? And the sad truth is when you look at it, you realize it doesn't. Killing an animal does nothing. It was faith in God that did the thing. In fact, Isaiah even says this. I don't desire your sacrifices. What, what, what are you What are you doing? You're sacrificing for the sake of a sacrifice. That does nothing. Uh, that does nothing. So here we have all these dilemmas, and it sounds like almost contradictions in Judaism that are resolved in Christianity. The purposes of Judaism are resolved in Christianity. So, you know, we're doing this. Why? Well, now we have an answer. Jesus. Okay. And then the promises present in Judaism. How can you possibly have a human king that reigns for forever? Well, if he's also fully God, and if God became a man, now we have a resolution. Um, and then there's a lot of things, like, for instance, all throughout the Old Testament, in Job, for instance, or in countless other books, where it'll talk about a being that has to be God. Has to be God. And we'll talk about it in human terms. Or talk about a being that has to be God that hasn't yet come yet, like... A redeemer uh, uh, and all these different things well now we have that in Jesus um, he, re he revealed himself and acted slash acts throughout history it's not a God that simply sat back it's a God that did and then kept doing I believe that Christianity has the right answer I, I have studied other religions I've even studied other cults to see if you know, maybe they were onto something. None of them really made sense in the long term, and none of them really left with peace. And that's ultimately the biggest uh, belief that I can I can give for God. When when you get involved in occultic activity like Ouija boards and contacting the dead and stuff, it doesn't leave you with a sense of peace. You have nightmares. You don't sleep well at night. Things just are amiss. When you encounter these other gods, it doesn't give you a sense of comfort or direction or, or anything. It's just it's just terrifying. Like it, Shiva in, in Hinduism, it, it's not it's not a good it's not a good god, and it doesn't bring you any joy or happiness. And then you're left with the same problem of repeating the cycle over and over again in hopes that you get it right, and building up this the, this this positive or negative karma and all this nonsense. And ultimately, there's nothing you can do because you can't contact your future self or your past self. So how are you supposed to know where you are on the spectrum, or how much longer, it, or if what you're doing even matters? There's also no idea, no idea of morality in that kind of an, in that kind of a system, because Adolf Hitler, for instance, doesn't have to pay for his crimes; he just has to be reborn as something lower. You, you have a serious problem there. You have a lack of answers. So whereas it's easier to say yes, there's no God, Sci science says there's no God. Well, actually, it's a lot more complicated than that. And you might say, well, hold on, aren't you kind of nitpicking this to death? Well, that's the idea. We should be nit nitpicking this stuff to death. Not that we'll ever have all the answers. But we shouldn't stop with saying, you know what? I want to believe this, and therefore it is. We should, we should seriously think and consider these things, because if we're wrong, 
then everything's at stake. Everything. I want to go to the grave with peace. I want to go to the grave knowing what I believe is right. And I have that confidence now, and I didn't have that in any of the other beliefs.